Welcome to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life from a bird's eye view on the reality of being. I'm pleased to welcome Kathy McDaniel to the podcast today. We're going to talk about her book. It's a memoir, Misfit in Hell to Heaven Expat. Kathy literally died and came back. So she had a distressing near-death experience. And this is interesting because a lot of people talk about near-death experiences as seeing light and being fluffy and being wonderful, but Kathy's experience was the opposite of that. So she was dying from lung failure, and this was in 1999. And she was also placed on a ventilator and put into a drug-induced coma. When she experienced the near, uh, the NDE, the near-death experience, it was traumatic for her. And she explains this overwhelming bliss of what she calls heaven and it shifted her religious beliefs into a deep spiritual belief but before that before that she had some pretty scary experiences she saw some pretty disturbing things and um they eventually integrated the experience into a very distressing nde and she now has the ability to accept this sacred mission that caused her reluctance to return to today, to Earth. She had a choice. She felt she had a choice. She was going to return, but she, at one point, she wasn't sure. But she now, she's now able to share that experiences and the messages that come with it. Kathy's been a guest on various platforms, and her book is fascinating. So, Let's welcome Kathy to the show. Kathy, thank you so much for being here today. Good to see you. Good to see you. So I would like to talk about your experiences with near death. And um, you have written about it as well. We'll come on to your book. I think for people who don't understand um, what people mean when they say a near death experience, it would be helpful to educate our listeners about what that actually means. So from your perspective. Uh, the term near-death experience is kind of nebulous. Uh, it's, it's not a scientific term. It's more of a experiential term. Some people uh, think you have to be dead uh, your heart has to stop, uh, whatever, but then it's near death. If you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> this is this is just short of either being dead or staying dead. I guess that's probably the best way to put it. Uh, some people that, uh, I have a friend that's had three cardiac arrests and never had a near-death experience. And then I know people who have come uh, pretty close, or they've had what's called a kundalini kundalini awakening, which is when all your chakras line up, and you know, there's it's just not something you can nail down. Yeah, Hope that helps. Sorry about that, Kathy. <laughs> yes, well, we lost you, you froze up just for a minute when you as soon as you said kundalini, so I don't know what oh. that means. <laughs> yes, that's that's pretty funny. Yeah. When we come back, we have this thing with electricity. Um, so I'm used to things kind of going out uh, or getting weird. So and if you want to just chop that out, I can go back to saying that Kund Kundalini is when all this, you know, energy comes in. So I don't know if I tapped into something or what. Okay, where do you want to start then? Yeah, that no, that's good. What you were saying when all this energy comes in, and then I lost you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, like I say, I, have you had Betty Guardo on your show yet? No, no. She, okay, she's kind of an expert in that. Um, she had pretty weird experiences. Um, there's also uh, uh, spiritually transformative experiences. There's out-of-body experiences. It's just growing and growing uh, with the amount of 
things that can happen to a person. Uh, some people can um, spontaneously do this. Some people can do like regression therapies with a, uh, someone and that'll come come up. So it's getting to be a very large, multifaceted field. Right. Yes, it is. So that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Maybe we should talk a bit about your experience. And I know it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. A lot of people are talking and interested in NDEs. And there is a lot of research being done as well, which is really exciting, I find, because I think it's about time. And most of those research boards do have scientists on them. So this is really good. So I was saying about NDE. So a lot of people are, you know, it's being researched, which is great. I, I'm all for it. Thank goodness. I think it's about time. What has been your experience and how, what happened to you? It's a rather lengthy ordeal. I'll give you the, I'll give you a shortened version. I had been taking care of a friend and uh, he had leukemia. So for eight months, I was not getting much sleep as in a very stressful situation with him. And then he died. So uh, there was a bad flu going around very akin to COVID and I caught it. And within short order, I went from pneumonia to uh ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as lung failure. So I was in the hospital. My family was called. They back then, this is 25 years ago, we were kind of like guinea pigs. And so uh, they said, well, we'll have to try this, this, and this, but you're better off being in a coma because you're not going to have any fun. And I said, whatever, you know. And uh, so the family says, yeah, okay, we'll be here. And they gave me, the last thing I heard the doctor say is, I'm going to give you something called white amnesia, and it's going to take your brain offline. We don't really want you to remember what's going to be happening here. So you'll be in a, in a coma. That means nothing. It, it just, you will have no consciousness. You know, I didn't have a, cha a choice, really. So I did get the anesthetic, and I went out. And then I became conscious. And I had no idea where I was. It was pitch black. It was totally quiet. And I had no idea if I was standing or sitting or whatever. I was afraid to move. So I just kind of hung out thinking, well, maybe this is part of it. Um, but then I noticed that it was uh, there was kind of this reddish glow starting and it was getting lighter. And I, I really thought that I was someplace where the sun was coming up and I was glad that there was going to be some light so I could figure out what was going on. Well, as it got lighter, it got warmer. The fog began to swirl around. I I started smelling something really bad. And then I started hearing people shrieking and moaning and yelling. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, where am I? And um uh, this voice came out of the fog. It was kind of a spooky voice. And it said, do you know where you are? And I thought, uh, hell, <laughs> you know, that was the only thing that, that came up. And he just did this maniacal boo-ha-ha -ha kind of laugh, scared me. And I ran into the darkness. And that's how it started. It became a series of segments, 25 years of uh, going back over this and over this and over this uh, in my mind, trying to make sense of it, which doesn't ever happen, uh, and talking to a lot of other uh, ND ears. And it's interesting because the distressing uh, experiencers hide. We don't like to talk about it. It's embarrassing. It's uh, You don't want to remember it. People usually go, you know, back up and say, never mind, never mind. I don't want to hear about it. So um, this is what happened to me. I, I kind of clammed up. Um, the segments, the first one was like in a bombed out city. And and there were people running and screaming and, and fires. And, and it looked like either there had been an atomic blast or an alien a you know, invasion. I really didn't know. I just was boom in this situation. Um, I felt the whole time I was uh, in this 
experience that I was running for my life. I never thought I was dead. I mean, you don't feel dead because your soul is you. Your body isn't you. Your mind, your brain is not you. Um, so my spirit and I were having this experience. Um, there were demons. There were nasty people. There were zombies. There were, you know, every kind of horror that I could imagine. So that when... I finally got out of there. Uh, it was through sheer grit and willpower. I, I managed to hang on as long as I did, which I feel later was part of the plan. Um, I did get out. And at that moment, there was like, I don't know if you've ever seen a helium balloon. You know, you put a little flat balloon on helium and it goes whoosh. That's what my soul did. My, I just whooshed and it was bliss and joy and just incredible happiness. It still chokes me up. You know, it was fantastic. And um, I was I was just floating in this love and I couldn't remember anything that had gone before because this just whole thing just permeates every molecule of whatever is left of you. And, and um, as it is it start, started to kind of solidify and to make some sort of visual sense, I was able to see my friend who had died the month before and he was standing there and he looked great. And after dying of leukemia, you don't look great, but he did. And he looked much younger and he looked happy and he was even wearing a sweater I'd bought him for like Christmas. And so it was him and I was shocked. And I thought to myself, oh, shoot, he doesn't know he's dead. You know, I'm not going to be the one to tell him. And he started laughing. And I thought, wait a minute, he heard me. And and I I, I paid a little more attention. And I I kind of remember seeing over to one side this this architect's table with this huge one that opened about halfway. And I remember he was showing me something in that book and and uh all I remember saying is, oh, no, that's going to be too hard. I want to stay here with you. And uh, now he's 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 looking at me and telling me, I'm sorry, you got to go back. You do have too much left to do. And I was shocked. I was angry. I did not want to go. And I said, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, I just crossed my arms. Up. This is not an option. And poof, you know, you wake up out of a coma. And there's people milling around, and and uh, I thought I was back in hell, and and uh, then it turns out to be my mom, my 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 daughter, my sister, and I was totally confused. I'd been out for almost three weeks, and um, of course my adventure seemed like years, but in reality, you know, uh, it was just very confusing. So I had another month. Uh, in rehab facility trying to get my strength back. I was down to 86 pounds, so I had no muscle mass left. And it was a long, horrible journey with this 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 memory uh, that was not a memory. It was a reality that was I was afraid to shut my eyes. I was I didn't want to go back there. It was just a horrible, horrible existence. And like I say, nobody wanted to to hear. You know, my mom says, geez, Kathy, what did you do to go to hell? And I says, I don't know. I, you know, I'm a good Catholic girl, man. I, I I don't know. And oh, you'll get over it. It was the, you know, it was the drugs. It's it's just a bad dream. It doesn't go away. So I spent a lot of time writing it out. I thought if I can just get this out of my head and stick it in a drawer, I, I can go on with my life. Didn't happen. So fa fast forward to 10 years later, I'm um, still trying to deal with all of this stuff, still confused. And then this series of synchronicities started happening. You know, somebody said, you know, I, I think you'd enjoy going to this, this meeting. There's going to be a psychic there. They can see, see spirits. And, and, oh, that was kind of interesting. And then I went there and then I met somebody who said, oh, you got to go up to an IONS meeting. There's this guy named Greg. Here's this card. He'll, he'll help you with, with what's going on. And, and finally, you know, talking to Greg on the phone and he beat my story out of me. And, uh, I was, I was relieved, but I was embarrassed. I was scared. He said, ah, you got to come up to a meeting. 
And I said, where? You know, it was Seattle. That's where we are. That's our, the, the IONS group. That's the International Association of Near-Death Studies. They started in Seattle 40 years ago. And I'm 45 minutes away out of the whole United States. So I drove up, listened to a couple meetings, went twice, I think. And I thought, nah, I'm not hearing what happened to me, man. I'm hearing angels and puppy dogs and rainbows. And no. So I was sneaking out of one of the meetings and Greg caught me and says, what's wrong? And I said, where's the rest of us? You know, he says, well, you need to get up and tell your story. I said, I'm not going to get up in front of all those people and say I went to hell. And he says, yeah, you are, because we need to hear it. So it took some guts, but I got up there and and uh, there was there was a sold out crowd, man. They heard that there was going to be a, a distressing one. Yay, bring popcorn, you know. So I got up there and I started with a story. And then being a storyteller, uh, they were wrapped. I mean, their eyes were all bugged and they were with me on this on this journey. So that made it easier. And then when we all got out at the end, there was this big sigh of relief and everybody's clapping. And I thought, wow, that worked, <laughs> you know. So uh, after that, I started getting badgered by the voice. When you get back, you've got a couple things, uh, as you now know. One thing is you're kind of messed up when, a, when electrical things happen that are spontaneous and usually um, inconvenient. And then the other thing is you hear the voice, which is really your conscience, your guardian angel, whatever your whole life may be, you know, you're going to do something and you say, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. That gets really clear. So the voice started in with, you got to write a book, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. And that took... Um, a long time before I I got uh, corralled by some lady at a conference, an IONS conference. She was a medium and she had a little booth set up for, you know, the conference you wander around during between the speeches. And she had a little booth. She had been in pub book publishing and she was starting her own company. And it says her sign says, do you need to write a book? So I'd kind of, you know, walk by her every time I came by. And the last day of the conference, um, she was closing up and I, I went to dodge her and she stood right in front of me. And she says, "You." they say, you need to write a book. And I says, who's they? She says, I'm a medium. They say, you need to write a book and I'm going to publish it. Well, now I'm cornered. So it uh, then COVID hit. And I'm stuck in the house with nothing to do, right? So I wrote the book and it, it took a while. Um, got it published, I guess it was in... 2020, so four years ago, and uh, then then it's like, how do you how do you get a book out there? I mean, there's like a thousand books a day that hit the press, and and you know, so I said, okay, God, I guess I I'm stuck here. I can't. Uh, and then somebody called me from New Zealand and said, I'd like you to be on my podcast, and I had no idea what that was. And I says, I can't afford to fly to New Zealand. No, no, you do it on Zoom. So, of course. Her lights went out. Uh, I mean, we had nothing but trouble uh, trying to get that thing uh, to work. But she also had had an NDE. So we got double trouble here. In fact, the entire block, she said, went out. She says, I've lived here 15 years. This has never happened. We, you know, she had to call me back and say, I don't know what happened. The whole block's down. <laughs> it's really hilarious. So uh, that started one and then somebody said I saw you on her show and now I've done a, over 140 of these things uh because that's what God wants me to do you know I was sent back to give this message which most people are surprised to hear never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now thank you for your support you make this podcast possible now back to the show um, I believe I manifested that whole thing uh, due to my religious upbringing. Um, I believe I pre-planned my life, so I, I believe I volunteered for this. And um, the real message is that God is all loving and all forgiving and would never condemn anybody. I, I kind of believe, and I don't know this to be true, um, there's a couple statistics I like. Um of, of all the NDEs I've heard now, the distressing ones, and I've heard quite a few now because they find me and um, want to tell it. Usually on my um, sharing group, we have 
uh, second Thursday of the month through IONS. It's for the distressing people. And I can't tell you how many times they say, I have never told my story to anybody, but I feel safe here. So, but this, this is one of the things. And I would say 85% of the people or more that have distressing experiences are Catholics. And I think that's fun. I mean, it's a good statistic. We are taught from a very early age that there's purgatory. And it's just like hell, except you get out. And it doesn't matter that Jesus saved you or anything else. You're going to have to do your time. And I believe we make our own purgatory because we expect it. And I, I believe also that if someone that's Catholic is going to die, they're going to get over there and say, oh, man, there's no purgatory. It's just us that come back to tell people. Don't worry about it. You know, it's not going to happen unless you want to. There are some souls that they don't want to be happy. They don't want to be with God. I mean, there's positive energy on this planet and negative energy. And energy cannot be destroyed or created. It just changes. So if if there there's probably, and I don't like to think about it too much because it, you know, can get stuck on you. There's probably a place for negative energy on the other side. And those souls that want to go, they can go. But that's not God doing that. The other thing I've learned from many of my friends that have been over there is that there's a life review. There's no judgment. Uh, there's no St. Peter's book. There's You get to see your life, start to finish, uh, and see how you did. Because we all plan to learn things and do things. And then the other part they do is they kind of flip it around and you get to see how it it felt to interact with you, to be with you. If you were kind to somebody, you get to feel that warm fuzzy. If you were mean or short or downright cruel to somebody, ouch, you're going to feel that what that pain that you caused. And it's it's more of a karma, not a, a punishment. Uh, it's because you want to know what your life meant. And um, most people find it fascinating. Uh, the ones that come back, they they say it's it's really good. You got you know a couple of usually guides or or spirits with you that you know say you know wow you did good there or could have done a little better there I guess, but it's all good and and I I feel so blessed to be able to be on programs like yours. I thank you uh, to encourage people and the last thing that happened and I like to share with people is that when I got back, I was, you know, freaked out understandably for a very long time. But as I started understanding things, I, I said to God, I, I, you know, I don't want any more thou shalt nots. Give me some positive stuff that I can do on a, on a daily basis to keep me on track to share with people. And I was told to be loving, kind, merciful, forgiving, encouraging, grateful, non-judgmental and useful. So I've kind of been working my way doing the steps for these 25 years and I'm down, I think to useful. And I, I read something the other day that says usefulness is the greatest joy of life. And if you really think about it, what you're doing is useful. So um, that's kind of in a nutshell what I've I've learned incredible and there's so much in that thank you for sharing that so a couple of few well i want to say a couple but there's a few things there i want i was going to ask you did you believe that you were in between worlds which you know i was raised catholic as well oh boy <laughs> right through high school and before uni my dad brought in some uh colleges all catholic i said you must be joking absolutely <laughs> for you no way <laughs> i'm going to a catholic university i love it <laughs> anyway. but yes so i understand purgatory i understand all that do you believe uh, no then actually you explained it and when you were saying you know you thought you were in hell so tell us though oh gosh i've got so many questions but tell us um <laughs> when you were there and it was difficult and you heard the sounds and it didn't sound comforting it didn't sound comfortable it did not sound relaxing or inviting well 
<laughs> no. Yes. Where did you think you were? Not feeling dead was very confusing. So I just felt like, I don't know, Alice in Wonderland. I I didn't know how I got there. I I didn't realize it was hell, but the demons were kind of a clue. Uh, you know, um, I just felt like I know I'm going to get out of here. And I don't know if that was that, you know, underlying Catholic, you know, Jesus died for my sins thing, but I... I really knew I didn't belong there and I had to get out. I did remember that kind of thing where they say the the unforgivable sin is despair. And they kept saying that. You got to give up. You got to despair getting out. And I, I knew really deep inside, I thought, no, 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 I know I can't do that. I can't do that. So I'm going to keep fighting. And um, I got real tired there at the end. Um, I, I thought, Maybe I'm not going to get out of here. I uh, I was starting not to lose faith, but just running out of energy. And so at that very end portion where um, I said to that demon person, I said, you know, I've been, I've been here a long time. And of course, there's no time over there. It's just eternal now. But that's long. <laughs> I'll tell you. I said, I've been here a long time. Is there something I, I'm missing? What, you know? And she says, well, it's Christmas on earth. That's always the worst day in hell. And that's when it hit me. I thought, I, I couldn't refute it. It, it. What else could this be? And then I got mad. You know, I thought, well, I'm not giving up. I don't care. I'm just going to be a pill. I'm going to be a brat. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be strong. And I just started singing a Christmas carol. And I knew that was going to tick her off, which it did. And so uh, that's when she, she jumped at me like she was going to beat me half to death. And I just closed my eyes. I thought, I don't care. And that's how I, you know, when, when the bliss thing happened, I don't know. It was, it was at the, the the psalm, song was uh, way in a major, and I got to the part where the little Lord, I didn't say Jesus, but that's what was the next word. And I don't know if that was just the realization uh, of, you know, my my religion, my background, something clicked. And um, I, I knew it would would cause distress to the demon, but I, I really didn't know that would be what would got, got me out. And um I've had people, you know, uh, try and figure that one out six ways from Sunday, but uh, it worked. And and somebody, you know, some people say, well, gee, you're a Catholic. Why didn't you call on Jesus? Why didn't you ask God? Why didn't you pray? Because I didn't know I was dead. And also, I don't believe God goes in those kinds of places. God's not wanted there. So that that idea didn't wash over me. And that was part of what I had to do is is be brave and get get the hell out of there so I could share my message. You know, it only took 25 years to figure that out. Still, it, very insightful. So, you know, we've, as a, because I work as a medium as well, um, some of the, a lot of your concepts that you explain were very validating for me. I've often told people that some of the things you described. So, and I just wondered for you, um, do you believe there's a bit of a holding place or what happens there in your experience? You were in this space and all the Catholics out there will be, if maybe not just Catholics, I would say Christians perhaps will be thinking, well, you know, what did you do then to go to, to that space? And, how did you live your life? And because it's a very judgmental and blaming, and I'm I'm sorry. Um, well, no, I'm not sorry, but no. I don't uh, I don't mean to offend anyone out there. Remember, yes, I, up, yes. I still believe in God, so mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying anything against. But let's face it, Catholic guilt exists, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there are many other religions that have lots of guilt like that. But I'm wondering uh, for you, 
do you believe that there is this space that's a holding place and do we figure it out as we when we're there or was it just i like the way you described when you were singing away in the manger and the words because words are very powerful that word that name you were just there and boot you were back um so was that a, a bit of a holding place or do you think you had to just experience that? I think that was my experience. Uh, there has been, if you want to talk scientific, uh, there's been so many studies about that, uh, you know, and the, the bottom line is there is nothing to prove that good people have good experiences and bad people have bad experiences. There are an innumerable people who are uh, good that have the opposite. And there are, you know, atheists, people who, you know, don't believe in God, wouldn't want to be with God and boom, they're in the good place, you know? So no, there's, there's nothing to tie um, that. Uh, there's no proof about that. In fact, it's, it's, disturbing to a lot of people uh, to think that it doesn't make sense to us. That's not what religion taught us. And um, I believe, oh dear, you have to tread lightly. You know, I, I, people need to believe what they believe. I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling people how my beliefs changed and, and, and you know, there's no one right way to God and, uh, Everybody goes to heaven, okay? Everybody goes to heaven, no matter what. The atheists go to, there's, they've got this pleasant surprise. You know, they get a, oh, wow, can imagine that? Um, it's just, we, it, when you understand we've planned all this, you know, we, we came to earth to learn and uh, you got nobody to, but yourself to, I won't say blame, but you're, you're a brave soul. I mean, Earth, there are other places out there to go, uh, other planets, other universes, other places to go. And I, I've been told more than once that Earth is the toughest gig. It's only the brave souls that come down here. I mean, this is, Earth sucks, all right? Uh, it, it's it's heavy. It's it's dark. It's, it's difficult. Um, so anytime something happens to me out of the ordinary car crashes or whatever i say okay that's not god punishing me that's me saying kathy i wanted this experience because this is going to come out of it and then then i can turn and i can look at that a little differently and you know uh, it's a blessing this 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 life uh to come to a place where you are and i am is a blessing and that's what we're sharing here is everybody is a lot better off than they think they are and life is so short here it's you know when you're in eternity this is a blink of an eye i could see you know sitting down and then you've got other people your soulmates and and everybody's going to come at a different time and you've probably been on you know hundreds of other lifetimes with these spirits and this is going to be another one and when you start realizing all that, like you and I probably are in a soul group and we said, okay, this time we'll just meet for an hour. It'll be fun. We'll, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll share something together and help each other. And then I'll see you later. You know, we'll get together later. That changes everything in your life. It, it makes it so much lighter and brighter and meaningful. And the people that you meet, you can, if they're really, you know, you're going, rah, 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 rah. you think, oh, wow, this has got to be one of my soulmates. You know, <laughs> we're, 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 we're going to work this particular thing out together. And again, you lighten up, you look at the other side, you look at deep in their eyes and say, you know what, I, I think I know you from somewhere. This happens all the time. You know, have I met you? You know, uh, you know, where was it? Because you're soulmates. And, and, and you remember just a fraction of why you're going to interact this whole thing is a play and we wrote the we wrote the lines um absolutely it changes everything it does indeed and i'm glad you mentioned that because what you're describing is that that experience has changed your view of religion 
and of how you perceive now through that experience what actually happens why we're here and the growth because i feel just as you're speaking about it it's a feeling of soul growth or growth on this planet and people often talk about this being a learning a teaching space earth and we can see that through something like your experience yeah it's great to be around like the ions group or the, there's the spiritually uh, so there's sai there's i'm going to a conference again um this fall and to get four or five hundred people that have had these experiences together of course one thing is you know the computers go out the sound goes out the lights go out <laughs> it's a mess we got one guy that just goes from room to room putting the computers back on um but the energy is so positive and so uplifting and so happy and people from all over the world and it, it doesn't matter and um you don't want to go home you don't want to leave that energy it's it, it's it's that heaven feeling and it's it's uh, just talking about I haven't been and I'm already sad I'm leaving. Uh, it's it's uh, this whole thing has been a blessing. And for so many years, I thought it was a punishment. So um, anybody out there that have had a distressing experiences, look us up. That's you're not alone. And you're OK. You're a good person. That's really good advice, because as you say, Many people do have NDEs and they're afraid to talk about it. You may never know what has happened. So it's it's up to 15% of the people have them, you know, um, and just don't say anything. They just suffer in silence. I like what you're saying here about the contrast. Um, I was talking to a medium not long ago who said, oh, you know, spirit world is all glory and it's nice, it's safe, it's lovely. And it's not something I've experienced being a medium. I've certainly had spirits where I've had to say, no, nope, back out, back off. And I felt I had to protect myself and to put up energetic and I, I, it wasn't make-believe, you know, the computer would go down or something would fall off a table. You know, I've had crystals being knocked out of my hand. Lots of different things have happened. So I know that all of it's not light and bright. So yeah. it's helpful to hear that someone like yourself who's actually been there as such has seen that side. Or a medium like myself, it's a bit of a selfish thing, but I'm for me, I'm happy to hear it because it's yeah. my experience, really. Also, well, it, yeah. yeah, there's negative energy out there, and and you and you you're right. There, you can't mess with that stuff. You know, Ouija boards and and anything negative, I stay away from it. I don't watch movies with that kind of stuff. Uh, uh is there's definitely a dark side over there and you want nothing to do with it also you saw your friend um there and you said that you didn't think he knew he was dead as so. <laughs> i well i knew he was dead on earth i so to see him was just shocking plus he was 53 when he died and he looked 35 now and i thought you know what's wrong with this picture uh, and that's why he was laughing uh because you know he was saying uh <laughs> you, you're kind of in the same boat now. Um, yeah, it's great. And my dad died three years ago, but he's with me all the time and talk about letting us know. Um, he had this thing with my mom's got dementia pretty badly and, and uh, she's 97. He was 97 when he died. So uh, for a while, uh, oh, months and months, uh, soon after he died, I'd be talking to her. I call her every night at the same time. And she'd kind of get keep going and going and going. And then the phone would go dead. Just go dead. And uh, she'd call back and say, well, why did you hang up on me? And I said, well, I, no, you hung up on me. So it, I started watching the clock and I'd call her at 7. And at 7.30, the phone went dead. I, I don't care if she was on the landline, the cell phone. Or she called me. I called her. Just like that. And so she, we both got to saying, well, we better go. It's, it's 728. Dad's going to hang up any minute. And um, 
months and months and months he did that. Um, he still does things with lights. You know, I'll be in a room and all of a sudden the light starts flickering and then then I'll, I'll say, hi, dad, you know, and then I'll stop. Um, I've even been other places when he's done that. And now people there say, oh, it's just Kathy's dad, you know, when the lights are flickering. Uh, the other day we were in the hospital, my my poor best friend, I took him into the hospital and we were sitting there and, and waiting for in the emergency room and we're all nervous and we're just sitting there, sitting there. And all of a sudden there's by the sink, there's a uh, an electric thing where the uh, paper towels come out and we're just sitting there and all of a sudden it turns itself on and out come paper towels. And we're kind of looking at each other and we both go, hi, dad. <laughs> so um, that, that again is such a cool thing to um, know that we're loved and we're watched and, and we're never alone. Uh, and, and when we get on the other side, we can go haunt other people. I don't, not haunt, you know, just support. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. That just don't get to be a part of your, your family your your friends, because you're all one anyway. Uh, we're all just people. I mean, soul is just God. We're God having an experience. Um, you can get real esoteric on that stuff, but basically we're all one. I just like to remind you all to click that like button wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. Absolutely. Yes. I will, Welcome to my world. It's oh, good. I used to not be able to have clocks in my home. And finally, oh, have, really? I have a brand new clock. All the, they just stopped working. I, I would put a battery in it and then boom, it was gone. All sorts of lights, all sorts of things. So it is, it can be tough, but you work with spirit as a meeting or a spirit and just say, look, stop. Please stop. You yeah. sometimes have to keep asking, but it's okay. <laughs> I just hope I haven't started something again by talking about it. I know. <laughs> but we had a we had a glitch when we started this interview. So it's very interesting how energy, you know, we still get the proof daily. On a daily basis, we get proof that it exists, that there is life after death, and people still go, Well, I don't know. So that's fine. I just say That's fine. They have a nice surprise. Absolutely. I believe what I believe. We can have the conversation where we're both on the other side at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but I would like to talk about your book. So yes. uh, you've written a book, a memoir, Misfit in Hell to Heaven Expat. Right. Uh, the Misfit in Hell thing was I, whenever they told me to do something, I said no. And have an expat, I think, is is fun. An, an expatriate is somebody who works, it lives in one, in one country, and then they go to another country to do their work, and then they come home. So we're all heaven ha expats. Mm -hmm. We start in heaven, we come down here, we do our work, and then we go home. Like I've it. even got that as my license plate. <laughs> yeah. 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 But tell us why you, you were inspired to write the book. But also, it sounds like you were guided. You were sort of told, this is what you mean or you should be doing. Bullied, I think, is the word I would use. <laughs> yes, and it was fun because, you know, where do you start? I mean, this woman told me I had to have, I don't know, like 20,000 words. And I just sat down at the computer and I thought, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? And, and, and I thought... All of a sudden, I'm starting to get stories, you know, from dead relatives, you know, remember the time grandpa did this and remember, this is how, you know, your grandma and grandpa met. And so now I'm just a steno lady, you know, I'm just taking notes and uh, it grew. And every time I would think I was done, I'd go back to the, the gal and she said, I didn't say 20,000. I said 30. She did this all the way up to 50,000. I was ready to kill her. <laughs> but the stories kept coming. And then you know, I thought, oh, well, this goes here and this goes here. And then you give it to an editor and then they play with it a little bit. And it was all of a sudden a book, start, finish. Um, and, and she was happy. And uh, yeah, 
it's inspiration plus I signed up to do it you know the whole thing if you just understand um just go with it quit bucking everything <laughs> just if something shows up you know if somebody wants to be on a program or something um most of the I mean I I say yes but then I go check their show and then uh if there's something there that I'm not comfortable with I will explain why I think I'm going to be an irritant to your audience, like in the deep South, they don't like me there. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't go there because I don't want to push some against somebody's beliefs. And that's not my, that's not what I'm, I'm here to do. I'm just to here to explain to people who want to know. And that's the beauty of uh, the internet, though. People don't have to click on a video or listen to a podcast. They can just make up their own mind. Oh, um, that's true, too. Yeah. Absolutely. And stay away if they need to. <laughs> mm -hmm. But whilst you were writing the book, I wondered, was there anything, as you were recalling your experiences and getting all this new information from spirit, from relatives, was there anything that stood out that may have surprised you or that you thought you, you'd forgotten and then it, you remembered it? I think going back like that, there's a lot of things just stuff, you know, you, you don't want to remember those things because they were painful. Um, I think it was a blessing to be able to look at those things with new eyes, with fresh eyes and kind of put them at, to rest. Uh, you know, the things that I just did not want to think about at all, but to be able to forgive that person saying, well, this was just part of my journey uh, in the future. I would be able to be a source of um, uh, comfort to someone else in the same position. I think that comes out a lot is what I learned. Empathy is good. Empathy is is a beautiful gift you can give people. I mean, sympathy is pretty much worthless. But empathy only happens when you can truthfully say, I know how you feel. So if you, like I had, you know, my first baby died. I had a couple of friends afterwards that lost babies. And they would say to me, you know, people say, oh, you'll have another child or something cruel like that. But you know how I feel. I can talk to you. You know, you say it's going to get better. I believe you. So that was a big thing. That was a that was a plus saying that, yeah, my my life meant something, especially the one the things I thought were bad. Mm. Oh, God, that was so powerful. I could feel the energy of that. And I'm sorry to hear about those difficult experiences you had. Yeah. Um, yes. And, you know. Also, with your health, when that illness happened, um, it, it sounds as though it was just out of the blue. Or, or have I got that wrong? It sounds as though that wasn't, you didn't know. Well, I was very run down and very depressed and very tired. And so when that, that it was a virulent flu, uh, we went to a, a, a choir performance and people were literally falling off of the, the stage. They were so sick. And then we had dinner with the maestro uh, that was sick and he sat across from me coughing the entire dinner. So it's not a surprise that those two coincidences um, sent me, you know, but then again, I must, I planned it and um, I, I did, uh, I'd never been that sick. And so my friend uh, was out of town and I called and I said, I can't get down this three flights of stairs to get to the dock in the box. I, I'm, I'm coughing blood here. I, I've got to get to a doctor. And so he drove 40 minutes, uh, picked me up and took me down there. And just as we drove into the parking lot, I felt my my spirit was just like sinking. I was like leaking out of my feet. And, and I thought, wow, this, this is bad. And so I said, I, I'm dying. I'm dying. But it came out, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I opened the car door. He slammed on the brakes. He ran around. I was passed out. He picked me up and carried me inside. There was no pulse. Um, 
and and they called an ambulance they got me going again and took me to the hospital so um all that you know it just happened the way it was supposed to. i wasn't supposed to die i i had too much left to do i guess i guess i know um and i'm still doing it 25 years later it's 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 interesting um every time someone says i don't know what i i would have done if i hadn't met you uh, you know it, i i hear somebody say it me being there made a difference and i have this this uh like a, a board up there with all these people that I've got to get to. And I keep, I keep checking them off and checking them off and thinking, gosh, when I get to that last person, won't that be fun? <laughs> I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I, I'm enjoying the ride. I'm enjoying doing something meaningful with my life. Uh, that feels like I say usefulness is the greatest joy. Um, and, and when it's my time to go, I am packed and ready. You know, I, I am ready. Yes. And you will know as well. It sounds like you will know. And um, what are your thoughts? Just a just couple of quick questions before we end about people who have several near death experiences. I wonder why. Have you got any thoughts about that? Why would that happen? Is it just something? I don't know. Maybe they didn't get the message the first time. You know, they have to have a reminder. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I wondered, but I think you're right, though. That's it, really, because isn't that why we call all experiences into our lives um, for yeah. lessons and learning? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I think maybe, you know, with people that are doing drugs or something or trying to commit suicide and and uh, they get another chance, you know, no, you don't want to do this. I don't know if you have to start all over with a new life. I've had people say that. They said, fine, if you don't want to like this, my friend Betty, if you don't want to go back because she had a, ah, I would never trade with her. I <laughs> think she's had a really rough life. She's, I can't do this. And they said, fine, we've got this little baby over here that you can get into this body and start all over again. And she said, no, 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 I, I'll go back. I'll go back. So I think you do have a choice, but it's not a good one. Interesting. Yes, because you said you knew you wanted to come back. And that's exactly what you did. I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to come back at all. But uh, I'm glad I did now. But it oh, took fine. a long time to accept that. Right. Okay. I see. Because it's really, really nice over there. <laughs> really really yeah uh, you know what it was i was thinking about when you were talking about when you were faced with the that entity that you described that wasn't very very nice and you had to get away and you you know and that's what i was thinking about but yes the way you described how nice it is it's exactly how a lot of spirit world describe it to me and uh, sometimes i say to spirit oh come on surely Somebody <laughs> must at least take your favorite chair now and then. Come on. <laughs> there has to be something. Somebody's used your favorite cup. I don't know. Something's happened. <laughs> I don't know. They, they, I, all I can think about is maybe they get bored, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, it sounds like there's so much to do. But then eternity is is an extremely long, 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 endless sort of thing. So, you know, it might sound like fun with some of your, your your soulmates and say, "Oh, come on, let's let let's just try it one more time. This will be this time. It'll be a lot more fun." You know, and you get talked into it, um, or else I don't know. We'll, we won't know till we get there. But ah, uh, yeah, it's it's nice. But what what a life because it's still life. You were near and you. Very succinctly explained at the beginning of the podcast, it's near death. It's not yeah. death. So what a life you've had and <laughs> still, well, still having. I'm still having it, man. It's still happening. It's still, still meeting new people, new uh, challenges, uh, really having to say, what am I doing here? Why is this person in my life? Um, it never gets any easier, um, but I'm never sorry, you know, uh, when I, I get to know that person a little better and, and then we start getting those synchronicities and then you laugh 
you say, oh my gosh, this is too funny. You got to hang in there. You got to, if, if somebody's in your life, they're there for a reason and you better figure it out. <laughs> oh, wow. I think I needed to hear that. <laughs> I think I needed to hear that right now. Yes. Because you get older and you think, okay, I've learned a lot and life should be easier. And then somebody pops in, you either have to be with them on a project or something's happening and you think, oh, wow. Okay. This is here we go again. <laughs> here we go. What do yeah. to learn now? <laughs> yeah, I know. Every yeah, and it happens all it just you get things just settled down and you think you're coasting and nope. Nope. Somebody challenges <laughs> and is horrible or overly kind or something and you think, Oh, why are you being so nice? What do you want? Or um <laughs> No, I I jest because uh what you were saying, usefulness is key, but also kindness. And as you were speaking about being given sort of the, the tools or the, how would you say, formula perhaps to follow? Yeah. Loving and kind is number one and two. Loving and kind. Everything else comes from that. And that just means taking a breath, you know, and say loving and kind, loving and kind, and then trying to emote that. And uh, that's the best. You know, you can't go wrong. Just those two being loving and kind because a lot of a lot of religions a lot of people say well i'm this religion i'm that so i'm i am loving and kind but then they treat people horribly yeah no. and so i don't care i always say to me i don't care what religion you are how do you treat people that's right how do you other souls people? other souls and i you know uh something dawned on me the other day uh, we've got I belong to a senior center and we get all kinds of people coming in there all over the world. And, and uh, we were talking and a person who he was from India and he's dark skinned and, and uh, we went to someplace for lunch and people kind of looked at us, you know, and I, and we, we just want to say a body has color. The souls are all the same color. What, this is a costume I've got on right now. I, I my costume is a white old lady and, um, but I'm really the soul that is just like you. And it's, I think if people could understand that, that their body they picked is a costume and the real them is the same color as everybody else, <laughs> same fabric, same makeup. Um, you know, you treat people a little differently that way. Absolutely. And the, the, this is a huge life lesson, I think, human beings have been, uh, I suppose, given to work with somehow for centuries when we're not, we're not even there yet. I mean, centuries and centuries and centuries. And that is, as you said, Earth uh, sucks, I guess. Um, Earth can be difficult and... Um, it's funny, I'm interviewing a monk soon, so we can talk Ooh. about some of that. But That'll be fun. And that that one lesson, but it's to do with differences. I think people find power in feeling that they're different from other people. So, yeah, Kathy, you have been amazing. Thank you so much. I think that you've helped to simplify, if it can even be done, though, to help us understand a bit more about... Uh, near-death experiences and what you experienced, but also to drop fear about talking about it. So mm -hmm. anybody out there, if you've had a near-death experience that wasn't all bright and light and crystals and love, <laughs> please either contact Kathy, <laughs> buy the book as well. And I'm going to put a link to the book in the show notes. Buy the book because that will help you as well. I think that will help you You describe experiences in the book, other things in the book. So that's a good place to start. And also her website, which a link will be in the show notes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Kathy, it's been great to speak to you. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.